podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to the Hedged Edge by RCM Ag Services, where we're getting out of the field and onto the mic to bring you weekly market updates, commentary from commodity experts, and monthly interviews with the biggest names in agribusiness. Welcome to this week's edition of the Hedged Edge. I have taken a short break from our regular updates and actually gone out and had some fun. Joined my colleague, longtime colleague, Jeff Malik on the derivative and uh, been talking with farmers and working with producers as well as uh, commercials all across the country and really across the globe. And, um, you know, get the opportunity to come back today and jump full steam ahead uh, back into commodity markets. And we're gonna, we're gonna do that with our very own King of Cotton. You guys know him, he's a, he's a legend, Ron Lawson. Uh, Ron, welcome to the show. Yeah, good to be here. Welcome back, I should say. So, um, Ron, we're cotton. I, 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 wanna, I wanna know about the atmospheric river actually, before we jump into cotton. You, you're in Northern California. I've read, reading about this thing. Uh, it's talking something like uh, the amount of water equivalent to the Mississippi River. I'm, I'm not sure what we're dealing with, but how much rain happened and what are the effects for your, your area? So basically, if you talk to the meteorologists, like the state meteorologist from Sacramento has informed us that historically in California, 85% of any annual rainfall occurs during 14 days in, okay. in the year. Okay. So it's not 14 consecutive days, but, you know, 14 days. So the last three days, we got a big chunk of that. Um, the conditions are ripe. You know, it comes up from, it, you know, the moisture gets pulled up from Hawaii. They used to call it the Pineapple Express, but that's not politically correct anymore. So okay. now it's the Atmospheric River. And in, uh, in our area here, just north of San Francisco, uh, certain areas, Marin County, a lot of people have heard that name, uh, Mount Tamil Pius, they got 17 inches of rain in a 24-hour wow. period. Wow. And, that, and that's a wet spot, obviously, I mean, because the, the water gets compressed against the hill. But even in Sacramento, Central Valley, Flatlands, uh, they had more rain in a 24-hour period than has ever been measured uh, in a 24-hour period. And that's going back to the uh, late 17, uh, early 1800s, depending on which, which group you believe has the longest the statistics. So wow. it was a, quite an event, quite an event. And, we, and we, you know, you've been so dry. You've got all these um, reservoirs and rivers and uh, everything that has been just decimated. You know, you, you see pictures of boats that are yep. docked up here and the rivers down here. Is, it, is, it, is this going to fill it up or what? Now, this won't. This will not kill the uh, the drought. It'll put a dent in it. it. The most important thing is to put out most of the wildfires. Got it. That heavy rain came in and that. Not, not just knock down the existing fires, but put the moisture back into the uh, ecosystem that will help uh, knock down any more fires as they come, make them less severe. So that's, you know, hopefully we get another couple of these storms this year and can put enough snowpack that'll take us over the hump in the next. Well, I wish you guys the best. Uh, you know, it's been crazy. The, you know, the smoke has made its way all the way east and everything. So um, great. Well, keep us posted on the uh on the rivers so we'll oh, yeah. get back on that rivers in the sky yes exactly so uh jumping back to cotton cotton is a market it's you know showed up in the wall street journal it's on cnbc everybody you know knows now what you've known for for a long time cotton prices have uh exploded um really from the from the lows of covid we're looking at you know over a 236% range or from low to high um it's, it's been an unbelievable run, up 20% in the last month or so. Um, talk to us, what's, what's the main driver and why are we seeing such a crazy, crazy move up? It's, um, it's a combination, obviously, just like everything else. You know, when COVID hit, there was an immediate shutdown of everything, mm -hmm. stop of production. Uh, within, within 48 hours of retail being shut in the U.S., you know, 
shipping orders out of Georgia warehouses were canceled. You know, so normally, you know, it's from from thread to or from from bale to the shelf where you could buy something at a local store. It's you know, it's going to be a good four to six months. Well, in two days, they back that whole pipeline out. Right. So there was a huge there was a huge vacuum. And then we've come out of it and there's the lead time as people start to buy it. Now, if you look at the balance sheet, it's, it's somewhat tight in cotton. We've been tighter, uh, but with the logistics problem thrown in there, can you get it? When can you get it? How much can you get it? Um, that's given us a, a base from a supply demand balance sheet fundamentals. It's not a negative story. It doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of cotton out there. It just means there's not a negative story out there where typically we're trying to lower prices in the cotton market to find the demand. Now the demand is out there and there is a, a hurdle to converting demand into consumption. Right. You know, normally we use those two terms in the, you know, either way, but no, there's demand out there, but with the logistics issue, um, you know, consumption is a concern. But with that base out there, what has happened, and more importantly, vastly more importantly, is cotton has gotten the attention of hedge fund managers, uh, you know, money managers out there. And it's for some very good reasons. Number one, with the macroeconomic uh, air about us of inflation, whether you want to call it transitory or, or whatever name you want to give it, there is no desire to be short much of anything. Right. Uh, you want to be flat or you want to be long, but you don't want to be short anything. There's just uh, the macroeconomic air doesn't doesn't support that. It doesn't, so pay, they, it doesn't pay to take the risks to no. be short a market that, you know, is a part of a potentially larger commodity cycle. Right. Right. So then you go to look at, well, which markets, uh, you know, these most of these fund managers guys are technically driven. They have the understanding of the fundamentals because they call and ask us and <laughs> tell them what's going on. Right. And then they look at the charts. Well, they look at this chart, that chart. Oh, look at cotton. That's a heck of a nice chart. So it's it's my understanding that if even if you're a very large hedge fund, you can't have an expert in every single commodity. Right. You've got well, you have computers who, for that, right? Right. So yeah. they look at now, let's look at charts because the chart can be applied to anything. So when they look at the charts, hey, it's cotton's got a pretty good, pretty good edge to it. Um, well, let's look at the rest of the agricultural sector. Well, okay, it looks better than most. Oh, wait, there's one, and this is something I like to throw out to people if you, you wouldn't think about it. Look at the oats market. Oh, hey, so nobody- it's funny you're bringing up oats. Uh, Jody is also a part of the podcast regularly. He's been watching oats, saying they're the leader. So I'm interested. What are you? What are you thinking? Oats. So I found out 35 years ago when I went into a, a big miller and was trying to sell, trying to open up an account, and this old feller explained to me. He says, "Son, nobody speculates." in oats he goes the only people that trade oats are oat people okay <laughs> they're bona fide hedgers that yeah. produce it consume it or convert it they're the only people playing there's no speculative noise sure. there's not the, the index funds the hedge funds they just don't they just don't get in so it's a pure play with on agricultural commodities with no speculative noise and it's a great bellwether that way because you can follow the general attitude in the macro side. And, you know, Oats has a, a, an added story of late, you know, oat milk, big thing, big consumption jump. But right. that's a that's really just a drop, if you will, in the bucket um, on the amount consumed. It's a, it's, a, a, it's a grain that can be consumed by humans, simple stomach, and, and ruminants, animals. So it's the universal grain. So if you follow Oats and they continue higher, that gives you the the, the macro attitude of the agricultural demand in the world. It's a, a global market. Right. So here we got agri- we got commodities in general. Don't be short. Uh, we want to look at the charts. Okay, well, let's look at the ag charts. Well, that oats, that's the overall side. Well, oh, cotton, cotton looks great. The speculative participation is massive. And it's all on the, either the long side or flat. Right. We're not seeing anybody go short, which, which is, has been a, a tendency historically. So we've got a fundamental supply demand situation that is not bearish. You can call it neutral. That's fine. Yeah. We've got a technical perspective that the chart is, if you go back and look, the long-term trends are firmly in place. We've got a money flow that is definitely pushing the speculative traders longer. And even during these volatile times, we've had some very volatile times, up 400, down 200 in a day. The open interest hasn't changed. 
Right. So the specs are just digging their heels in. They 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 want a long position and they're holding on to it. Well, I can tell you that that's true. You know, we track lots of hedge funds on the alternative sides of the business, and absolutely, core position is long cut. And uh, right. the only times that, is- that you're seeing them lighten up position is not on sell offs, but rather expanded volatility when their models kick in and say, all right, this is getting a little bit too risky. Let me take some risk off the table. Yeah. And they've been printing money for, well, the guys that we've been advising since we were back down at 49 cents and we called the bottom back in April of 20. So I I think that if we look at the four legs of of an analysis, fundamental, technical, uh, money flow, as we just discussed. And finally, this gets into the weeds and where most people don't go the structural issues of, of commodities. Uh, and so what I mean by that is the structural issue of the futures contract itself. In the, in the cash market, mills purchase cotton on a basis, on on call. So they'll buy it X at this price over or under the futures market, but I'm not going to get an absolute price until later down the road. So they fix the supply, but they don't fix the price. Without boring you with the details, what it means is at some point between now and the December contract, any of this cotton that was priced based on the December futures, a futures contract has to be purchased. Right. So what as we get to first notice day. Can I ask you about that um, yeah. real fast? Is it that they have to price it or what about if they roll it? I mean, why can't they roll it like they would in grains or, or whatnot and defer... Sure. This, the storage, you know, you know, pick up the carrier with the storage and just continue to move it forward. But you, you know, you've okay, mentioned so a few times that they have to price. I'm curious. They have to price um, because normally you've got a contango, a carry, deck, March is higher, May, July. Right. Currently we're in an invert. Right. So the guy who sold him the cotton is not going to let him roll forward at a loss to the merchant. Mm-hmm. I sold you cotton. You can't roll it forward because I'm going to have to get another... 200 points and no, I'm, the mill's not going to pay tax for 200 points. Right. Because that's what it costs the merchant to carry the cotton until that next time. Mm-hmm. So they're forced to buy December. Okay. Right now the imbalance. So just, just the people who may not know there's on-call sales and there's on-call purchases. So we right. look at the difference. Uh, the on-call sales, a futures contract has to be bought to cover an on-call purchase. A futures contract has to be sold. When we match those up, Right now, there's about a 23,000 contract difference. 23,000. How many have to be bought versus how many have to be sold? So if we look at where, if you have to buy 23,000 futures contracts, where are you going to find a seller? Well, well what's the open know? interest is the first question. And isn't it like 125,000 or something? Isn't that what it? Yeah, we're down to 108,000. So okay. normally what you have on the sell side are the index funds, right? By, right. by rope, you know, by lo- they're, they're long the spot month and then they sell the spot, roll the next. Right. So when we look at this, I, I, I kind of call it a, a financial physics. What you have is ob- obligatory buying that's gonna face off against selling tied to other purchases because you're gonna roll, the indexes are gonna sell deck by March. Right. So here you have absolute buying against spreading. Right. That's going to have a much stronger upward influence because you know the spreaders don't care. They just trade the difference. But if you got to find some of the outright short deck, you got to go up to high, high prices to find that. So that's the structural thing we're looking at. And it's not something that's just, yes, it's it's part and partial to uh, to the deck contract, but the March is starting to take in on call sales as well. They picked up 8,000 net last week. Okay. So 8,000 contracts more have to now be purchased in March than we were a week earlier. Is so that, middle, uh, is that uh, outside of the normal pattern this time of year to see this uh, larger spread or, um, or that it's many? Just the, amount, just the number is, is it's unprecedented how much that they are buying on call. Now, there's, there's two sides of that. On the one side, you can say, well, they must have really strong order books. That's why they're obligating themselves to so many contracts. Right. There is the thought that, though, if they were really convinced they needed the cotton, they would just buy it. They wouldn't go on call. They would just fix price, buy this stuff. But that's right. just not the way they think. To me, this is, this, is, this is another example of the demand that's out there. 
and the fact that you don't want to be short anything. Even within the industry itself, nobody wants to be short time. Mm -hmm. So we've got fundamental supply and demand, we've got technical, we've got money flows, and we've got structural all supporting the idea. You don't have to be long, I get it, but don't be short. Now, let me ask you a question. So you, we've talked a lot about supply and demand, and we're talking about cotton, which is a smaller commodity market, but so I guess somewhat like it's like oats, it, uh, it really, you know, can be a bellwether of where uh, uh, real true supply and demand is. You also mentioned logistics earlier, and you know, I've been thinking about this a long time. I, I, I think that with the way that the logistical problem is happening, and I'm curious your thoughts, you know, the amount of ships that are stuck off the coast of California, the price of a container going from a few thousand dollars to now 20,000 a container. You've heard all the stories. Should we now be considering supply, demand, and logistics in our equation for price? Because, you know, in my mind, if logistics aren't there to support the demand or the supply, but then eventually there's no way for the supply to get to the demand and price may plummet because you get into a situation where there's no place for the commodity to go. Right. And yes, definitely something that we've taken into consideration as we have last season's cotton was sold quite aggressively and there, there's very few bales available right now. And the shipment numbers on the weekly export report prove that. And we haven't quite gotten the full swing of harvest for this current crop in the, in the full swing. And it will pick up. You know, it's interesting. We talk about this whole terrible issue in, in Long Beach, LA, but you got to remember those prices are all, when you cite those prices, you're absolutely correct. But that's all coming China, Singapore out. Right. The prices are much cheaper going West Coast back. Right. The problem is they can't send boatloads of empty cargoes back of empty containers because they'll blow over at sea and they, you know, that's a problem. Right. And, so and they're, they're, with cotton. well, that's, that's exactly what we see is that for cotton and other bulk commodities that can put in the hull of the ship as ballast, it's things aren't quite as bad uh, for the shippers as opposed to some of the other stuff. That's really but interesting you're, that you're, I, uh, I would just assume that it was uh, a lot the price going away, but you're saying the price is more coming coming to us. Coming to us, yeah. And I actually and it, read that uh, their government seems to be subsidizing potentially some of those ships to try and keep them competitive. And uh, we were talking beforehand, uh, that is a big issue, right? Is how can China remain competitive in this environment and not really uh, force production of commodities to non-water uh, driven uh, locations in Mexico, right. for example. Right. And that's, that's been the trend now is that, you know, China has recognized that if, if they, if there continues to be this logistics kerfuffle, they're going to no longer be the offshore site of choice for the world to produce. They'll bring it back and, and source it at home. In fact, in the cotton market, this is very specific, but I'm sure it's the same in almost every any commodity and any production. Um, there's a very high-end spinning uh, company that makes spinning mill uh, machines that actually take the fiber, make thread, take the thread, make yarn, take the yarn, make fabric. The Reader is the name. And in a uh, report that they came out for, for their stockholders, they showed uh, the top five destinations of companies ordering, countries that are ordering this equipment to convert cotton into product, okay? From 2011 to, to 2020, the top five were China, Turkey, India, Uzbekistan, and then Europe at all. In 2021, it's Turkey, Latin America, India, Pakistan, China. China went from first to worst. So what is happening is if you're talking about a shift in CapEx expenditures on a right. global basis, if you don't have to put your product on the water to get it to its consumer, you've got a massive advantage right now. So much so that you're ordering equipment, CapEx expenditures of millions of dollars so that you can then take advantage of it. And it's why we're seeing Turkey as a major buyer of U.S. cotton, despite the Turkish lira getting stripped. Despite Ergonom, you know, this last weekend throwing out eight diplomats, mm. 
they continue because they can spin and get into Europe. And that's, that's, they're a huge component now, more so than we've had them in the past. And that's the production out of Pakistan. Going, they'll, take uh, US, they'll take U.S. cotton. They'll take Pakistan. Pakistan Indian themselves, very, very active now because they're producing like crazy. Uh, India won't have as much left to export, which will then pe allow people to turn to the U.S., especially China, to turn to the U.S. for supply as we go forward in the year. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's absolutely interesting to uh, to imagine, and you know, it turns into perhaps even protectionist policies, right? You know, hey, subsidize companies to bring their production of you know t-shirts and everything uh, back to the U.S. I mean, you mentioned something a few weeks ago when we were talking about, and you just mentioned it—the lag time it takes to get cotton somewhere, product, produce it, spin it, and then bring it back to the U.S. I think you said forty some odd days. Now it's out to 70 some odd days. I mean, we're missing Christmas if uh, right. people can't buy their Snuggies and uh, whatever else they need to buy. Right. And, and when we're trying to, you know, quantify all this and look at what effect it's going to have on the balance sheet, again, it's yeah. the basis of what we're going off of. If you can't consume it, the demand doesn't count. Right. right. And, right. And, and, and what we have to try and gauge is how much consumption we're losing because of this because we typically measure consumption at the retail end and that's at the brick and mortar store, right? Right. Given, yeah. given COVID online merchandise, there's been a huge swing back towards producers direct supply where the margins can be narrower. The price to the consumer can be less because they're not paying for real estate insurance, labor, et cetera. So we've actually seen consumption keep up even though the, they haven't had the logistics that they would like. It's going to be a hard Christmas. There's just not going to be the, the color selection, the size selection, the style selection that you want. Right. And so we continue to see the demand is, is still there. There's too much money floating around. It's you know all the government money that's out there. Demand is there. It's just a matter of getting the product to the consumer. And that's, that's where we're starting to see these shifts. The mills in Mexico are, have gone from – now they're seeing eight and nine times order book size Wow! because they can produce and then put it on a truck and get it or a rail and get it into the U S where you can't get it here from, from, you know, Southeast Asia. Unbelievable. So how does a merchant protect themselves in this environment? And well, even a mill, I mean, how do they, how does the whole, they've got so much in the supply chain here, a producer, he's in good shape, right? He's got, um, you know, cotton that he grew, he's got a good crop here. He can sell at a solid profit. Then you've well, got the profit. next level, the, you know, the gins, the merchants, the mills. How do the largest players in this game protect themselves from these? these uh, well, what we've been advising our mills both here and abroad is to go ahead and fix their cotton, get it bought, get it priced. But their big concern, and this to get it into the biggest of the biggest arenas here, if, if, if you're a mill and I'm a mill, we're just competing on conversion. Right. All right. If I can convert it at a, at a, at a, at a wider margin than you can, I have a greater market share that I can build into. Right. So they, they tend to work in concert. They all want to buy at the same time and sell at the same time because they think they're you know, more efficient than the next guy. Sure. So that's, but that's what also it, 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 it ties their hands into going out and say, fixing, forward you know a flat price for eight nine months because what happens if the market goes down now i can't compete with you right. because i have a higher price no matter how efficient i am that's why the on-call sales are so is so built into the market so what we said was fix your cotton and then buy a put yeah all right so now you've got a price fixed now if the market goes down you buy money back in your pocket you're still competing with somebody and you're having that offset if the market goes up, you're looking, you're looking fat and happy because you've already got your price fixed. The other guy's on call and he's hurt. Right. So we've had some good success with the more forward vision uh, type of, of mills looking at, at going that direction. Merchants, believe me, the merchants know what they're doing. The big merchants, I've always said, if, uh, if you want to win a bet, you know, put a merchant in a game, give them the rules and they'll beat you at the game. Once you give them the rules, <laughs> these merchant guys know how to. 
You know, I, I, I harken back to my Merrill Lynch days. You know, Merrill Lynch as an, as an institution, as a company, started with money from a cotton merchant. Okay. So, you know, these are smart guys going way back. And right. so they're, they've been very active in taking protection of what to do. Um, as far as the, the, the producers go, we've been, as you and I have been counseling our clients here, you know, how to take on puts to protect against the downside, still capitalize on the upside, and that's working fine. Right. But looking forward in the next year, there's a whole change set of dynamics that's going to affect the entire agricultural sector and cotton specifically. And that for right now is the cost of production. Correct. Cost of fertilizer, you guys have been pointing out, has tripled in, in the last six, seven months. So which crops do you plant that have the lowest cost of production in regards to input costs? Right. Well, fertilizer, you know, is pretty ubiquitous, except maybe for soybeans. With their own legume, they produce their own nitrogen. You don't need to pay for that. Right. So I can see a, a, a difference coming for the coming planting season where it's just too damn expensive relative to soybeans for cotton acreage to increase. So... Here we have a high price, depending on what the price of soybeans are at planting time, as we'll go right back to it, where does a farmer make his most money? Planting right. soybeans, planting cotton, planting other food. And around the world, it appears, you know, food inflation is, is screaming, it's rampant. So if we go into next year's planting season, when food inflation is driving agricultural prices higher, cotton is not really something you eat. Right. So it may become the redhead stepchild for production. Well, that just means the prices are going higher. Right. So again, for next year's producers, you know, right now you can get around an 89, 90 cent base. That's a good profitable level. Uh, but you don't want to sell future short because you just don't know what could go on the front end. And next thing you know, you're making margin calls. So you buy your puts and then you roll them up as the market goes. I think that plan this whole year, I mean, we started buying puts, I believe, 60 cent range and uh, you have rolled up and uh, continued to do so over the 18 months. And, you know, it's, it's uh, been quite successful strategy. And I hope that uh, we have that opportunity again. Now, I haven't looked out on the forward curve for 22 beyond December. I know December is trading around 90 cents versus around 108 for December 21. What does right. the March uh, 22 uh, look like out of curiosity? Well, I'm looking at the close today. So we closed tonight, deck 22, 89.75. And then you go 88.51, 87.01. So you start to see carry again, yeah. as you would expect in a normal market. Right. And one of the one of the big, uh, you know, cotton guys. When we talk to the merchants and they're looking in the big picture, you know, their big conundrum is what do they do on the intercrop spread between July and next December? Yeah. Because you know, you you look at most markets. You know, there's no such thing as old crop, new crop, copper. I mean, it's just a <laughs> right. That's right. But with, you know, with cotton, prices go up each month, and then all of a sudden, new crop, right? right. And the same thing with their grain. So, what do you do with that? Does does July keep going up, and because there's a scarcity, the demand is there, everyone waiting for lower December next December prices. What if we don't have the December in the ground? What if we don't have the new crop? I mean, right. The old line is red deck. Red December, next December. Red Deck's job is to get seed in the ground. And right. That's what it's supposed to do. And so as we look again, what's the cost of production going to be? Um, you know, interest rates aren't going to make that big a difference. They might rise a little, even with the Fed boost, but they're not going to really hamper the farmers that much. But what are fuel costs going to do? Right. I mean, those are all tied to each other right now. Natural gas prices for drying and everything else is just, you know starting to creep up. Yeah. Yeah, and in a way, and I always say when you're looking, we started off talking about the macroeconomic side of, of commodities, you have to look at the energy prices in all forms of energy. So as you mentioned, that gas for heat is going to be used instead of making fertilizer or plastics. Right. Uh, crude oil prices higher. Corn, ethanol. So yeah. if you get that continued support from the energy markets in grains, as we mentioned, soybeans lead. Corn's going to go, and now what do you do with cotton? It becomes uh, it becomes a secondary production thought. So, you know, we, we see this thing playing out perhaps another uh, 12 to 18 months, certainly not in the pattern that we've gone, you know, from 49 uh, cents up to $1.16. Right. And, and I'll, let, me, let me just reflect on that. I say we probably won't do that, but we have done it in the past. Yeah, and that's, what was the what was the all time high? Uh, cotton two something two twelve two fifteen twenty seven. 
27, 227. 227, yeah. So I always say this to everybody. If you don't know the difference between a bale of hay and a bale of cotton, and you're just looking at charts, well, hey, cotton, it went to 227. It could do that again. Well, oh, yeah. oh, man, it's only a dollar eight. You know, so Five you more. Know, some the, yeah, some of the speculators still feel that this thing can go back and match that. Now, those of us that have been in the business for 30, 40 years, we realized what happened back then, why it happened, and why the conditions are different today than they were back then. Right. But these conditions today are different than they've ever been. Right. So, right. you know, there's, I've no always, new, there's no normal anymore. It's everything's right. thrown out. Yeah. Yeah. I, and they always say this time is different. And we don't say, no, 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 you can't say that. It's never this time is different. No, this time really is different. Yeah. You know, so we're coming out of COVID. It's this thing's, you know, the demand is still there. And again, the speculators have more money than the trade has cotton. Okay. So if they've got that attitude that they don't want to be short, you got to listen. You got to right. listen to them. So that's, that's how good. we see it. You know, yeah. Then, so I guess, uh, you know, with, with, with all of that said, uh, it sounds like really the opportunities continue to favor the producer right now. Um, you know, they should take advantage of the, uh, the higher prices in particular for comparison to where we were and what they probably paid to put the crop in the ground. Merchants said uh, pretty, pretty well taken care of. They'll continue to do well. And then the, the, the mills are the ones that probably need uh, to be the most active in this environment. Um, and so, right. yeah, I guess uh, that kind of, that kind of, wraps it unless you have uh, anything else that uh you know the group should be thinking about or um you know opportunities that you would put on the board yeah i would again the producers i would i would urge the producers to go sit down with their banker yeah and yeah. not many bankers going to say if you ask them geez i can lock in 90 cent new crop cotton there's not many bankers that are going to say no to financing that sure because for them you know it's about risk how do i lend you money how do you pay it back so but don't um, lock it in to the extent where you're going to sell futures, rather indicate you're exactly. going to have a plan for purchasing puts all the way up in the event that it continues. Right. Believe me, the banks are very attuned and, and accepting to those that want to have a floor, but no ceiling. Right. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. And we can, and we do with the option market. So don't be afraid of them. You know, you know they're, I always say options aren't like baseball. You're not supposed to understand them as a kitty gardener, right? So, <laughs> So, you know, learn about them. And uh, once you have a comfortable feeling with them, they become your, your most versatile financial tool. That's perfect. Well, I uh, appreciate the, the update today. This has been great. I mean, we, uh, we talk a lot, but don't get a chance to really get on air with it and uh, make it available to others. But uh, uh, remind us where, where, remind everyone they can uh, reach out to you and receive your daily research, um, the Logic Advisors or your RCM. Contact largeadvisors.com or uh, Ron L at RCM, uh, RCMAM.com. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, on LinkedIn, I guess everybody finds everybody anymore because we don't use business cards very much. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I just want to, when, again, on the, on the cotton side of things, uh, we're a very small market and uh, there's very few people that have a, a, a full understanding. So when you hear news about it, you know, you got to take, take your, your, pay attention because there's a, there's a lot of information. If you're looking for it, it may not come bite you right in the butt, but you got to know where to get the stuff. So keep yours open. Yours will be open. I guess last question is uh, who's going to end with a uh, worst record, the 49ers or the bears? Boy, they were hard to watch this weekend. I'll tell you, I've been a 49er fan all my life and I was cringing cringing at some of the mistakes they made well, at least they and scored more than three points yes at least they did that now you know you got to remember we're a little beat up and bruised out here because the giants you know they, the best thing about the giants i mean they had the greatest record right out there and everything, but the best thing yeah. is the Dodgers didn't go to the world series right so, right that now it makes us all turn to what are the what are the warriors going to do you know steph curry's got a crew to crew to, to battle this year so it should be fun to watch them that sounds fun too. Well, we'll uh, we'll all keep our eyes up and uh, see what's goes on in the markets. And obviously, sports are a big part of our discussions too. So, we'll okay, uh, awesome. Thank Good you very talk much, Ron. Catch up with we'll you soon. Thank you. Bye -bye. The Hedged Edge is brought to you by CME Group. CME Group is the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. 
For more information and educational resources about features and options, visit cmegroup.com. You've been listening to The Hedged Edge. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at ag underscore RCM. Like our Facebook page under RCM Ag Services. And visit our website to read our blog and subscribe to our newsletter at rcmagservices.com. If you like our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear them.